Court's uh, former employment to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office before becoming a judge. So with respect to subsection A, which relates to the judge being biased or prejudiced for or against a party or attorney, the burden in these matters is on defense to show actual bias or prejudice. The standard of review uh, for the court is whether actual of actual bias is based on an objective and reasonable perception. Um, one uh, notable holding by a prior Michigan Court of Appeals uh, is that actual bias is not established by repeated rulings against the litigant. That's in the MKK 286 Mish Act 546 of 2009 Michigan Court of Appeals case. And furthermore, um, the U.S. Supreme Court has identified four situations uh, that do present a risk of actual bias that is too high to be constitutionally tolerable. Uh, and this is coming from Crampton v. Department of State, 395 Mish, 347, a 1975 U.S. Supreme Court case. Those four situations as outlined are the judge has a pecuniary interest in the outcome. Number two has been the target of personal abuse or criticism from the party before him. Number three is enmeshed in another matter involving the petitioner. The four might have prejudiced the case because of prior participation as an accuser, investigator, fact finder, or initial decision maker. So in terms of number one, uh, there's no indication or allegation that the court has a pecuniary interest in the outcome. And number three, uh, there's no indication that the court's enmeshed in other matters involving the petitioner, that the court's just overseeing this one matter uh, that we're here for today. And number four, might have prejudiced the case because of prior participation as an accuser, investigator, fact finder, or initial decision maker. This court has not been involved in any prior participation related to Mr. Ewing or any of the litigation of the cases. Uh, so subsection two would be the closest to the argument Mr. Ewing makes regarding the court being the target of personal abuse or criticism from the party before him. Mr. Ewing notes that at a prior hearing, uh, he made statements uh, what he considers against the court or offensive to the court, I don't remember the exact language he used, um, in regards to any statements made by a party, uh, Mr. Ewing in this case, towards the court, uh, there's very clear case law on this, and this is, comes from Grievance Administra Administrator v. Jeffrey Feiger, 476, Mish 231 of 2006, a Michigan Supreme Court case, that when a party to a case calls a sitting judge a name or impugns the court, disqualification is not proper because the party cannot precipitate or create a basis for the disqualification by acting that way. Um, in essence, that would allow for judge shopping or form shopping. All the party would have to do is call the court a name, the court would recuse itself, and then the merry-go-round would keep going until the next judge and the next judge until a party may find a judge they see uh, that they prefer for whatever reason. Um, so with respect to subsection A, uh, the sort of allegations made by, or arguments made by Mr. Ewing that uh, the court's prior employment with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office has somehow um, creates an actual bias against Mr. Ewing uh, simply is not the case. Uh, it, Mr. Ewing specifically points out or makes allegations that uh, the court had previous friendship relationships with Kim Worthy, John Wichtala, Cam Towns, and William Lawrence. Um, the court can say that uh, during my employment with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, I had little, if any, interaction with Kim Worthy. Uh, John Wichtala, as far as I can recall, has always been assigned to the appellate unit, uh, a unit that this court never uh, worked in or had any real day-to-day -day interaction with. With respect to William Lawrence, who, as far as I can recall, is always affiliated with or is within the homicide unit, uh, another unit the court was never in, uh, and would have interactions with Mr. Lawrence. I think I had an office on the same floor for a period of time, um, but I certainly 
was never involved in any uh, anything to the extent Mr. Lomas was ever working on Mr. Young's case. I don't know if that was the case or not, but the court has no knowledge of that. And with respect to Kim Towns, who uh, has held many positions, when I was there, I recall her being in a number of different units, homicide, non-fatal shootings, perhaps some other units, uh, community prosecution. And Mr. Ewing points out that the court had previously been employed uh, for a time in the community prosecution unit, uh, which uh, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, Cam Towns had already left uh, the office by the time I was working in that unit. And certainly when I was working in that unit, if she was still there, she was affiliated with the homicide division. She was not my supervisor. Um, my supervisor was Kim Miles uh, in that unit, or that grant funded unit. Uh, I can't recall if when I was there, if it was called community prosecutions, it may have been under a different name, Operation Legend. I know that name changed at some point while I was there. Um, but nevertheless, the court um, did not have any uh, strong relationship with any of these individuals mentioned. Certainly never worked on or had any uh, affiliation with any prior uh, litigation or cases Mr. Ewing had within the office. I was not aware of Mr. Ewing at the time uh, and did not work on any of those matters as far as I know. So uh, for those reasons, the court does not find under subsection A, actual bias has been shown based on Mr. Ewing's arguments. Uh, further, under subsection B, which is a, a similar argument, uh, but it, it is under the, the language of risk of bias or the risk of an appearance of impropriety. Uh, again, the standard uh, of review on this is whether or not a reasonable observer informed of the facts and circumstances would could find an appearance of impropriety if, if the judge stayed on the case. This comes from Adair v. Michigan, 474 Mich, 1027, a 2006 Michigan Supreme Court case. Uh, in terms of ruling, uh, my ruling under subsection A is really applicable under subsection B um, in that these individuals listed uh, as being friends of mine at the office, they were co-workers, that's the relationship I have with them. Did, again, didn't work on any cases related to Mr. Ewing with any of those individuals. To the extent I ever even worked with any of those individuals in very minimal capacity. Uh, the last year uh, at the office, I was in a completely different division, the Special Victims Division, that had nothing to do with uh, any of these other individuals. Um, so again, the court does not find, based on the arguments made and the allegations made, that there would be an appearance of impropriety just solely based on my prior employment and the fact that I had coworkers uh, that may have or were a part of prior litigation or cases with Mr. Ewing. And then there's subsection E, which relates to sort of the judge was a, a partner of a party, attorney for a party, or a member of a law firm representing a party within the preceding two years. The argument is that because I work for the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, this is a case being handled by the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, that therefore means I would be biased in favor of the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, but there's very clear um, opinion with respect to this matter. Uh, while that may be accurate, for the chief prosecutor, meaning the elected position, which in this case would be Kim Worthy herself, with respect to assistant prosecutors or, or prosecuting staff uh, that work under an elected prosecutor, Michigan State Bar Ethics Opinion JI-34 states that uh, an assistant prosecuting attorney that's been elected judge is not considered a partner or member of a law firm within the meaning of MCR 2.003. Specifically, goes on to read that a judge who was an assistant prosecutor and who is not substantially involved in a particular criminal prosecution and thus gained no confidential and admissible or prejudicial information while an assistant prosecutor need not be disqualified as a judge hearing the case. As I've already indicated, I've been 
assistant prosecutor. I was not the elected prosecutor. And at no point in time during my employment there was I ever substantially involved in any uh, matters involving Mr. Dean. Um, so again, the arguments under this prong of the disqualification statute uh, fall short and the court does not find that uh, that prong would be applicable in this case. So for all those reasons, the court is going to deny uh, defense's motion to disqualify and uh, we will proceed uh, as planned. Um, before I do that, is there anything from the people? No, thank you, Your Honor. Anything, Mr. Your Honor? Yes, sir. Uh, first, uh, I think the court failed to realize that I already so argued that the court, I believe it was last year on uh, December 1st, the court denied my motion. Well, the case law first says that the judicial movements can require uh, removal of the judge when he shows a deep seated antagonism or favoritism towards the prosecution. Uh, when I was here on 12 1 24 or 23 in front of the court on my motions, the court took and twisted my arguments inside my Brady motion, which you didn't address, and said that I was saying that the state was suppressing uh, cell phone evidence, Facebook photos, and federal disclosure of Christian Rock uh, Richardson from 2010 trial. You twisted my whole argument and made me out to be a liar. But you don't call me not a liar once, but three times. When all alone in my motion, if you read, I said that stuff wasn't disclosed in 2023, haven't been disclosed in this proceeding. I still haven't got it to this day. So when you talk about the deep seated favoritism or antagonism against the defense, not only did I file a motion for discovery, but uh, my co-defense counsel, a lot of the court, and his motion to exclude identification. On page two, five, the photo array showing the love was undoubtedly suggested. However, this photo array has not been disclosed to counsel. So despite me and my co-defense counsel continue to alert this court, that this court, uh, that the prosecution to continue to withhold evidence, this court has not said anything, has not given one order, to disclose anything. Last time we was here, the prosecutor, after our hearing, gave me more evidence to establish Brady violations. It showed that in on November 1st, 2010, they received federal disclosure that said you and his innocent and didn't turn it over. You said, hey, um, concerning the Gaston, you and has not presented any evidence. But after we leave, on record, the uh, AP Sawyer passes me a document that verifies it that my trial started a month prior. But on November 1st, 2010, Cam Towns indeed received the uh, federal disclosure. Not only that, the court uh, continues to say uh, in 2010, it was disclosed to David Cripps. How can discovery be disclosed in 2010 if David Cripps was not an attorney of record be applicable today on the NCR 6.201, Your Honor. I have skill today. Doesn't have any of the Facebook material disclosed. I told AP Sawyer when we left, when we sat here at the end of the last court proceeding, he said, oh, I didn't know you didn't have it. Cripps had it. Cripps is not a counsel today. He's not standby counsel today. What is the court gonna do about the discovery that we still have today? And the, that, that's the deep-seated antagonism and favoritism. The, it hasn't been, it's been me versus Keeper Cox. Not me versus the people. It's, they haven't said a peep in any hearing. It's been you defending them in certain their positions. So today, was, what are we going to do for as far as the discovery? I still don't have discovery issues, and we go to trial next month. Is you going to issue an order or require another response? And then I filed a motion to following up from the last proceeding where I asked the court, Your Honor, can you compel the prosecution to turn over these things? Is it the court said just for clarity, is this the one that you filed yesterday? This is this is the additional one filed yesterday. I filed it yesterday. Be, well, it got filed yesterday because I called the clerk's office down here. It had been already here. But I filed it yesterday because I still don't have the information. They filed a status report and I don't have it yet. Yeah, so as it relates to that, just to sort of get ahead of you. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen the motion from yesterday? I saw I got an e-file this morning at about 6.50 a.m. No. What I do want the people to do is review that and to the extent there needs to be updates.
updates or information on what's the street you're, what's the street you're calling where you have all the lists of things and you can put um, the information you have on that. You called it something. You filed the document. But I can't remember. Oh, some sort of like status update. Status I'm just for status. Report. You know, look through whatever uh, Mr. Ewing filed yesterday in terms of his motion to compel, uh, and I want that status report updated and provided to counsel, Mr. Ewing. Yes, sir. And the court. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Ewing. So, uh, as far as the status point, what do we want to schedule a date to come back in front of before trial? When we go to trial without the information, I mean. You can file the status report. It don't just say anything. What the court's going to do is once I receive the, the status report based on the request that you filed yesterday, uh, I may need to file a hearing to address the report. May not. I, just, I don't know until I see what they file. So on the MCR 6.201, I believe is uh, F, I believe. Uh, the court is not going to set a order for them to disclose. I mean, Prior to this court, this, this proceeding has been going on for almost three years now. Claim for an or, order to full disclosure. Progress notes. They told you that they turned over the progress notes last time. You you accepted them. I said, hey, you know, I, I don't even have the progress notes. We come in last court hearing, they say, hey, they never existed. But he said they was in his office. Okay. On that particular issue, I think, if I'm recalling correctly, is this the item that the police weren't familiar with the language, or was it called something else? Correct. I know there's, there's there's certain things related to this: ledgers, notes, progress notes. And I know, at least from my the best of my recollection, there was an understanding Mr. Ewing ha had of what they were, and a different understanding of what the police had. Has that all been figured out? Correct. Detective Lisa Johnson, the officer in charge of this case, wasn't familiar with the phrase progress notes. She's not sure if that means sort of handwritten notes or something. I mean, that's not an official phrase for a Detroit Police Department report in their reporting system back in 2009, which is when this case took place. And was this OIC able to determine, based on what Mr. Ewing was requesting, what he was referring to in terms of what he understands that to be? She was not. Okay. Meaning they don't exist. Correct. She, she suggested perhaps he's referring to sort of handwritten notes that an officer might write in their notepad before finally, you know, inputting it into a formal police report. And all those police reports have been turned over, but she wasn't familiar with the phrase progress notes. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Back in 2009, DPD took progress notes that listed everything they did before they changed over their procedure. And everything that was done in the case was logged into the system. Uh, in this case, DPD received information in this case. They got to have some type of track record of when they received this information. I filed a motion, uh, speaking of that, I filed a motion to make witnesses available for an interview on MCR 6.01A1, and the court struck in those records, but failed to realize that I filed those on the MCR 2.119, the good cause exception, because the people said that they don't know anything. So now I have to interview the people who, who, who uh, these documents and who was contacted by Tyree Washington and the court just flatly denied that. That's talking about deep deceiving and antagonism. That's there. What about that issue? Okay. Is there anything else, Mr. Ewing? I, I, was, I was trying to ask you about I, Frankly, I need the information on the status report from the people based on your motion to compel you filed yesterday. I need to see what the status of these things are, and then if we need to have a hearing on it, we will. So but I'm not going to address these issues right now with you. Okay. They've, they've submitted what they have. They've turned over what they have. To the extent there's anything different in what you filed yesterday that they want to supplement their report, I want to see that before I make any determination. Right. Okay. So, uh, what about he said he was going to turn over the lien report, the contents of the lien, the entire lien report. We still haven't ever received that. He says that we still haven't got the contents. If I'm recalling correctly, didn't you state you turned over the information that was contained within the lien? Correct. I, and I did so to Mr. Sinclair several months ago, I believe. I mean, I am periodically updating any uh, required disclosure of conviction. But at this point, I have nothing further. And I just want to say one more thing. It's a little very disingenuous to say that I failed to turn over uh, the Facebook records of any sort to Mr. Ewing when those were admitted at the trial in 2010 as exhibits. 
So at this point, I do believe all uh, discovery, and I just think these continued uh, allegations are somewhat disingenuous, but I'll review his uh, motion that was filed sort of yesterday night and this morning, and I'll respond accordingly. Your, your Honor, how could it be disingenuous when you keep saying 2010? We're in a rare, brand new proceeding. I am counsel. I need the records. I don't have. I haven't been in touch with David Crick since trial. He hasn't been in touch with the records since then. So how can the, the state or you allow the state keep saying that it was turned over to David Chris in 2010. We're in 2024. He can't say that. That's disingenuous. That's unbelievable that he would even say that. All right. These Facebook exhibits, do you have them? I do. And they've been turned over by you? Correct. Turned over to If this proceeding has been on, going on quite some time, I, how could you have filed a motion regarding those Facebook images without actually having them yourself? I mean, that just doesn't make sense to me. But... You know, again, as I've offered many times, I believe there is a defense investigator. They're welcome to come to my office and look through the entirety uh, of the police file. Your Honor, I filed a motion specifically about the Facebook photos inside the Facebook photos. All right, I'm done hearing about Facebook photos. Oh, no, no. Anything uh, else? Yes, sir. Well, can we get, I just want an order for that information, Your Honor. That's, that's all I want. Can I Mr. Ewing, the prosecutor has just indicated that those have been turned over to you. Okay, so... Uh, Do you have anything else you want to say? Yes, sir, I got a few things. Uh, what about the uh, previous transcripts that was required, I mean, ordered? They never, I never received them. Every, every transcript you order, your co, your co-defendant order, we submit them immediately, the day of. Well, on January 5th, the hearing from January 5th, you said that the transcripts were supposed to be received by the 30th. It's past the deadline. Those have well, believe me, Mr. Ewing, you don't have to tell me um, how late some of these transcripts are filed in all my cases. You know, it's a completely different issue. But it has nothing to do with me. What about the court file? Mr. Ewing, I've already indicated and made a ruling on the court file. I didn't get it. I'm not relitigating your motion from December the 1st. We're here for one motion and one motion only. So if you have anything further on that motion is qualified, I'll hear that. Uh, I don't have anything further on that motion. Okay, and those transcripts were sent to your standby counsel. So they were sent to the standby counsel. Which one? January 5th. Rochelle, which one? Rochelle, are you still there? Which date are you referring to? I'm referring to my email. Just make sure. <coughs> oh. I can send you the email, but go ahead. Continue. Uh, the, uh, the, next, the last thing I want to address is the courts keep holding these uh, two separate, these separate proceedings. And uh, it's a due process violation. I object to any further separate proceedings. It, I, I'm, I'm, I've been privy to it. It's causing issues with Mr. Turner with his own separate proceedings. He, he, he filed his motions untimely, but the people filed motions and they said they didn't get it. You filed, you gave him a chance, but he rejected his motions. It's causing a lot of conflict with the way that you just run in the system. It's a due, it's clear due process violation. It's unfair. Okay. Mr. Ewing. I conduct hearings based on when filings come in on any given individual. So all your December 1st transcripts were sent to your counsel on December the 8th. So send those. No, the January 5th, Rochelle said she was going to send me a copy of the January 5th transcript. They have not been produced from search this hearing, which I wanted to get All right. so I could be informed of what's going on in the proceedings. And with but regard Judge, to the sure. January 5th, Rochelle sent an email to Blaze. I guess it, it, it looks like it might have gone to the other defense counsel. Okay. So, what did they say about the email? You're that, saying they were sent. They were sent out on January 17th um, to Blaze Tierney and Glenn O. and Mr. Sawyer and I were CC. Okay. okay.
So and they were waiting for Miss Peterson was waiting for the laptop that was um, conformed to Wayne County Sheriff's Office um, specs. As soon as we got that order, Mr. Ewing and I signed it, and we've been working with Miss Peterson to get you that laptop. Uh, and as you can see, we're following up and making sure you do get it. Uh, so we're on top of it. We're trying to get it to you as soon as we can. But it's out of my hands in terms of when Miss Miss Peterson actually is able to come bring it to you. Nothing from the editor, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, so, Mr. Ewing, I, I don't know if you were intending to or not, but I uh, was just, I suppose, anticipating. Are you planning on appealing this ruling to the presiding with respect to the disqualification? Yes, because we had preliminarily reached out, uh, reached out after I made my ruling to let them know. And I just wanted to place on the record. So we emailed the JA, that's Judge Knapp, would be the presiding mm -hmm. judge, uh, in terms of scheduling. Their court has notified us that it's going to be on the 23rd or the 26th at 8.30. Obviously, that's up to them. I don't have control over when they schedule. this one? Yes. Um, so I would be... Um, on the lookout. If we get any update on that, we'll obviously email that information to Mr. Sinclair. Uh, can I get a copy of those January 5th transcripts from the Mr. Sir? Uh, the the yeah. transcript, yes, the, the transcripts, uh, to the extent you don't have them, it sounds like they just went to a co counsel or your co defendant. Um, but I don't know why you couldn't get those transcripts. So we will uh, get those sent over to your counsel, Mr. Sinclair. Uh, is anybody getting printed off before I leave here? Uh, I don't know what the status of them, so I'm going to ask my J.A. to get them over to you and be able to contact them. Appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good one, man. All right. Uh, anything else from the people? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. So I do, I don't have a date set yet. Um, obviously, it'll probably be after. One week. Oh, me. Um, or uh, the parties, I mean. It okay. Was, it was a question. I understand. <laughs> So with respect to that appeal hearing, do the parties prefer the 23rd or the 26th? I would prefer the 23rd. Both Mr. Baca and myself start a trial on the 26th. Mr. Sinclair, does that date work for you? All right, so that'll be scheduled from Judge Knapp, 23rd of February at 830. Thank you. Is it a date for the status report to be due? Uh, start the trial so close? I mean, yeah, I'd like a, a filing by the people within a week to set a date. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Anything else, Ms. Gray? Oh, uh, I'll likely bring you all back in one final time the after the 23rd date um, just to go over sort of logistics and guidelines related to the actual trial itself. I don't pick that exact date yet, but we'll inform you and, and work with you based on that. Thank you, Your Honor. One last thing, Your Honor. Uh, is the court going to rule? I filed a motion to uh, about the cell phone and that they didn't object to or file a motion in opposition to, and the gang theory. I know that in both opening arguments, they can potentially argue this stuff. They argued the last time open arguments. But I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's working against the defense by knowing what is going to happen. If I do it in the during a, a, a open arguments that the court said when the moment arrives, I mean, the prejudice is already really done. Right, so the way that'll work, Mr. Ewing, is to the extent any of the motions in limine would be needed to be ruled on or necessary to something at the beginning of the proceeding, like an opening statement, for example. We would do those all pre-trial before we would set a jury selection. So we, you were going to rule on a motion in limine? Yeah, to the extent there's a motion in limine related to an opening statement like you just mentioned, I would be sure to do that before we even selected our jury. Before we select our jury. So it would be day one. On day one, we're going to do this? Yeah. You can't, there's no way that the court can consider doing this a week in advance or something so we can know exactly? I don't think so. I think we'll do it on the, the first day of that week, so we will. Yes, sir. All right, we're all set, everyone. Thank you. Gotcha. All right, we got a copy for you here. Oh, yeah. Um, just on the record, just briefly, we did get your motion about being measured for clothing. Uh, I have no issue with you doing that if Mr. Sinclair brought measuring anything, but that can all, that can be done right right here today. I didn't bring the measuring tape. Okay. Well, it was filed to see if we could come and measure your client, so if you didn't bring tape, I don't know how you plan on measuring him, but you can do that today. I just want to 
I asked for in the motion that it be uh, done an order issued for the jail to levy get me back. Yeah, I, yeah, in terms of jail policy, I'm guessing they don't want those types of tools in the jail. I, I don't know for sure we can confirm that, but if we want to do any measuring today in person or at a next hearing, I'm sure. So on the 23rd, when I go in front of the Diamond Act, you think that would be it? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, unless Judge Knapp has some issue with it, I, I doubt he would, but yeah, that would be. Appreciate you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, everyone.